Hi Year 10, Mrs Gatley here. Um, this is your first descriptive lesson and I just thought I'd start with a video message saying hi and I hope you're all well. I hope you're all managing to find a way to independently work through some of the texts and tasks that we've set you. If you're unsure, send um, an email to any one of us and that's all attached to the home learning and we can't wait to see you soon, so let's get cracking. So, this is your first lesson on your scheme of work that's to do with your descriptive writing. This is your inspiration lesson really, and I'm gonna guide you through about 10 lessons um, across, normally this would be two weeks in school, and it's going to uh, inspire you get you to memorise some of the descriptive language that we've used in the past and bring that from your long-term memory. So pause it here um, and make sure that you've got a pen, something to write on and an hour's worth of time. Now my lesson you'll see is recorded and it doesn't take an hour but I'm going to be asking you to pause and take your time during activities. So very quickly, if you've li listened to any of my lessons before, I've started to use these codes to help you through your learning. Now, not all lessons will have these elements to them, but there's definitely going to be some vocabulary in there, some tier two or tier three vocabulary. Um, it might be a new word, it might be a word that you need to reintroduce to yourself in terms of defining it or using it. At some point in this lesson I'll ask you to pause it when you see this symbol there might be a space for you to fill in the blanks to work on a worksheet and get through the answers you can do that by researching you can do that with your phone and also if you want to write on your phone or type this up in an email or a word document I'm more than happy to read any sort of information even if you want to take a picture of what you've written down and email it across then that would be great then we move on to this symbol. There will be a clip that's part of this learning. Um, so sit up, watch and listen. Look for why I'm giving you that video and the, uh, the, the reason that it's going to help us in our description. There should be some feedback and a quiz where you'll self-mark your answers or again, snap a picture. I know some of you have been sending me some stuff already this week and that's brilliant on little um, small starters and small... Re uh, recollection tasks to do with a Christmas carol so that's brilliant and then very lastly we'll recap what we've done in this lesson and build on it for your next lesson so anytime you see a lesson designed like this in the next few bubble sessions or remote learning it's by me Mrs Gatley and it's focuses, focusing on descriptive techniques and language now why so normally we would have done this in uh, the summer term of year 10 leading into year 11 and that's because you have got an English language GCSE paper uh, you've got two of them and paper one question five has a descriptive element a 40 mark descriptive element so hopefully this is starting to ring bells that I used to talk about this all the time what we're going to use in this lesson is Macbeth and even though that's our literature um, it's a great stimulus, it's a great starting point to develop your writing skills. Okay, So when you're using text that you're familiar with, the context or the situation, you're better story writers, you're better descriptive writers. There's no point giving you a story about a driving test when you've never taken a driving test before. What you could use is an image from Macbeth or the Scottish Highlands to inspire you to write a narrative story um, about battle scene or about walking through the misty woods and meeting witches. So the focus is to use those writing skills but it's also to use your literature text to inspire you to write descriptively. Okay, so what I'd like you to do now is pause the video and copy this out in full, filling in the blanks, please. Back. So let's go through the answers. And here you go. So we would normally do this as our starter task in class. You should have remembered, I even went through it if you were listening carefully on the last slide, that 
You have a narrative or descriptive task that is given by AQA for question five, paper one, and that's worth 40 marks. That's 50% of that paper alone. So it's a great area to gather really, really easy marks. 24 marks are for your content and organisation and 16 marks for your technical accuracy. But let's recap the reading paper. So I, I flipped this towards the first half of that paper and I want you to remember what to do for the first four questions. So you'll see that there's list four things, there's a language question where you should what, how, why it twice and that means giving me two paragraphs with at least some evidence in there um, about the topic, about what's given in the question, how is it given to you, in what sort of form, technique, structure or language uh, device and then why that's important to the reader. Why would ellipsis be used there? Why is the metaphor for the storm really important? Why not just say it's a storm? Then question three is the structure question and what I ask you to do in that is three shorter paragraphs, so not as big as the two what, how, why, but three shorter paragraphs focusing on the beginning, a change plus a zoom and a focus at the end. So I'll say that again, a beginning plus a change and then towards the end there'll be a zoom or a focus. So as long as something is switched and who the camera or who the writer is focused on towards the end of the piece. And then I finish this one off for you. Question four is the to what extent mini literature essay. So in that you need to evaluate, you need to give your opinion um, on the statement about the character. So for example, one of our characters might have been uh, not very well prepared for the avalanche, but that might have been because she was scared and you have to weigh up those ideas. So here I'd like you to pair up the following along the left hand side here starting with assonance and ending in personification you'll see that it's a card sort or it's a match up where they're not in the right orders because we definitely know uh, that adjectives are not corresponding vowel sounds. So if you could pause it here give yourself five to ten minutes on this activity I'd like you to write out the definitions and match them up please. And here's your self-marking. So here's the answers, see if you got them right. I'm gonna go through them with you. So assonance is corresponding vowel sounds, a repeated vowel sound um, in a structure, a sentence, a phrase. So that might be the repeated A, E, I, O, or U sound to emphasize the middle of those words usually to give you a sense of rhythm for some effect. Sibilance um, is a repetition or of an S or a Z sound. So it's a type of alliteration, but it's much more tailored towards this S sound. And that is usually to definitely emphasize some mood that's created. It might be a sleepy, silent, somber mood. An adverb, we should all know this, describes, modifies that verb. So the verb being the action, the doing word, they often end in ly but don't have to and they don't have to come first. Uh, bravely would be an adjective to, to describe Macbeth at the start and then I'd like you to think of a few adjectives to describe him towards the end. Adverb, sorry. Onomatopoeia is the formation of a word from a sound and is associated with what is said. So it's the really, I guess, the primary school snap, crackle and pop that sounds like it's meaning boom, you all like using. So be tentative and careful with that one. Adjectives describe the noun, the object, um, can be before it, to modify it, to give it a little bit more character. Verbs are the doing words. Similes are comparisons using like or as usually to lengthen something out to extend the idea of someone's character or how someone is acting and a metaphor is more of a direct comparison it gives a much more vivid picture quite instantaneously where one thing is said to be another so a trick way of doing this is start off with your simile 
and then take away the like or the as and it becomes that it embodies that character that roaring lion that person becomes the roaring lion because of what they're trying to say in your story and then very lastly there personification is to attribute a personal nature or human characteristic to something non-human so we want to give human we want to give the person's qualities and put that onto usually an inanimate object so the chair groaned under mrs gatley's weight now groaning is a verb that's attributed to a person and the chair is definitely not human so we've personified the chair war poets do it all the time in terms of uh, personifying countries to be female okay so at this point we want to use your new knowledge of recapping the self-marked answers and i'm going to read quite slowly to you um a lovely extract from Charles Dickens's work and obviously we study him in a Christmas Carol and you'll see similar patterns here you'll see that the bleak desolation you'll see the cityscape um, but what I'd like you to do is to identify and annotate around the page um, and obviously you can see at the bottom there the silver challenge is for you to gather um, evidence to prove that you know what assonance is if it's in there or adjectives or personification so listen and follow with me london michaelmas term lately over and the lord chancellor sitting in lincoln's inn hall implacable november weather as much mud in the streets as if the waters had but newly retired from the face of the earth and it would not be wonderful to meet a megalosaurus 40 feet long or so waddling like an elephantine lizard up Holborn Hill. Smoke lowering down from chimney pots making a soft black drizzle with flakes of soot in it as big as full grown snowflakes gone into mourning one might imagine for the death of the sun. Dogs undistinguishable in mire, horses scarcely better, splashed to their very blinkers. Foot passengers jostling one another's umbrellas in a general infection of ill temper and losing their foothold at street corners, where tens of thousands of other foot passengers have been slipping and sliding since the day broke, if the day ever broke, adding new deposits to the crust upon crust of mud sticking at those points tenaciously to the pavement and accumulating at compound interest. So here I've given you some annotations that I found. I've also underlined and colour coded some other techniques that I thought were particularly important. So for example, if I go for a very easy one there, waddling like an elephantine lizard. Hopefully you would all be able to spot that that is a simile. So pause it here, see if you could link up. You don't need to write all of this out at all, but see if you could either uh, do it orally or write it down in terms of just telling me what devices you see and then labeling those it's entirely up to you so see if you can find where things are relentless where the scene is set is the personification in there well i've suggested that there is the gold challenge is to look at the parenthesis um, if you know what that is you if not, you'll have to Google it and find out what that gold challenge might be. So spend a bit of time on here, either verbally or writing it down and snapping a picture of it and sending it to me. Um, try and identify these wonderful things that Dickens uses in his work. Okay, so on this one, it's again um, a later extract from Dickens' novella and I want you to identify three nouns, identify three verbs and tell me 
in a better way than I have done, why is the fog repeated? As you can see in blue there, there's so much fog. I've just scanned this and I can see that the fog is repeated all the time, particularly at sentence starters. And I've said it's because it's invasive and it becomes a character that stalks and haunts the London streets. Now, if you are going for the gold standard and you're trying that green one there, can you expand that? Can you give me some evidence and give me a paragraph to suggest why the fog is particularly invasive? And if that's a new vocabulary word for you, then you are um, more than welcome to pause it here and have a look at some synonyms for the word invasive. Again, I'm going to read it to you slowly and you're going to pause it and try and do the tasks that are on the screen now. Fog everywhere. Fog up the river where it flows among green eights and meadows. Fog down the river where it rolls defiled among the tears of shipping and the waterside pollutions of a great and dirty city. Fog on the Essex marshes, fog on the Kentish Heights, fog creeping into the cabooses of collier brigs, fog lying out on the yards and hovering in the rigging of great ships, fog drooping on the gunwales of barges and small boats, fog in the eyes and throats of, of ancient Greenwich pensioners, wheezing by the firesides of their wards, fog in the stem and bowl of the afternoon pipe of the wrathful skipper, down in his closed cabin, fog cruelly pinching the toes and fingers of his shivering little prentice boy on deck. Chance, people on the bridges peeping over the parapets into a nether sky of fog, with fog all round them as if they were up in a balloon and hanging in the misty clouds. So pause it here. You've got three tasks. The hardest one is the green one. Identify some nouns, identify some verbs, you're more than welcome to annotate and look for added parentheses or any of the language devices that you've already self-marked. And if you're going for the gold challenge again, snap a picture of um, why you think the fog is particularly important here. Why is it repeated? Okay, and this is a more developed writing task now, but I'm not really asking you to use your imagination. I'm using asking you to use your technical ability here. So the quick task, I'll read it before I tell you what the information is below in the white box. It says, choose one of these paragraphs and imagine that you are there. Convert it to first person. So it mustn't be in first person, so I'd like you to work out the narration style. I'm going to read it to you, you're going to choose one paragraph and you're go going to try and imagine that you are there. So you can tweak the language and play around with what you see, but using this as inspiration, I want it to be a first person account. Gas looming through the fog in diverse places in the streets, much as the sun may from the spongy fields be seen to loom by husbandman and ploughboy. Most of the shops lighted two hours before their time, as the gas seems to know, for it has a haggard and unwilling look. The raw afternoon is rawest, and the dense fog is densest, and the muddy streets are muddiest, near that leaden-headed old obstruction, appropriate ornament for the threshold of a leaden-headed old corporation, Temple Bar. And hard by Temple Bar, in Lincoln's Inn Hall, at the very heart of the fog, sits the Lord High Chancellor in his high court of chancery. Never can there come fog too thick, never can there come mud and mire too deep to assort with the groping and floundering condition which this high court of chancery, most pestilent of hoary sinners, holds this day in the sight of heaven and earth. You can type any of this information into Google and it will give you the document this comes from, from Dickens's text. Um, what I'd like you to do is simply choose one of these small paragraphs and imagine that you are there. I saw the afternoon at its rawest. Give yourself 10, 20 minutes on this one. And off you go.
Okay, so you've made it to your independent learning task now. You've done all the build up tasks, the things that I would go through with you quite quickly in class but really these times of remote learning are for you to go away and be given a longer task for you to sort of mull over and work with. So here is the glossary in the blue chart on the right hand side and we should know by now or we can skip back to the beginning of the video what the definition of each of these words mean. And here is our first introduction to a scene from Macbeth as well. Now we all should know that the scene in front of you is obviously a battle scene and it is most likely if we're using our inference that Macbeth is standing tall and strong and he is in the centre of the frame looking particularly noble, particularly brave, that this is very very likely the first battle against the Norwegian army. So what I would like you to do for your independent learning is to create a glossary of examples. So I've done one for you, but it has to be inspired by that image, imagining you are there or imagine it, that you can see this picture come to life. So I've done sibilance for you and I'll just read that out. It says, the slippery squelch underfoot was so unnerving to a brave soldier. So you could argue that there's three examples of sibilance in there, definitely slippery and squelch, um, and that's an example of onomatopoeia as well, and soldier towards the end. That repetition of the S sound is particularly important there and very deliberate. Um, so I'm going to end on this slide, but before I do, I'm going to take you to the trailer. So just um, under two minutes I'm going to play the audio and video for the Michael Fassbender version from 2015. I really recommend it's going to be in your um, your last slide. It's, I really recommend that you watch it, you watch this. It's a really accurate and faithful representation. So as I play this I want you to be inspired by what you see around you. Imagine that you could just zoom on those, these places and use your senses and think about what the smells are and how you might describe that using a simile. So I'll stop talking, you're going to watch the trailer for just under two minutes and then we'll meet back. you feel a bit inspired if you've got access to YouTube then you can find this trailer and pause it at particular scenes and think about the descriptive language that you might use so if we end so that's your final task where you can pause it and let's just consolidate our learning so really well done if you stuck with it hopefully uh, you've paused it and gone along and you've not just watched it in its entirety please do go back and do the exercises that have set you let's have a look at this vocabulary so some of the words on the list for 
descriptive writing might be new to you. There might be revision. So have a look at that list. I've chosen assonance there as we've focused on it on one of our examples. Do you know what it means? Could you use it in a sentence? And could you identify it? Have a think if you could by this point. Our main task today was to look at descriptive techniques, not necessarily lots of descriptive writing, although you've got some Dickens extracts to pour through now to take your time. And the focus being how has Dickens used those techniques? Why not watch Macbeth on YouTube now? Um, or one of the devices, one of the platforms that it's on. I know that recently it was on Amazon Prime. If not, there's lots and lots of free stuff on Macbeth recordings of it, there's an Ian Kellen version, and there's a Patrick Stewart version. So why not take this moment and go and watch Macbeth for some inspiration and revision. I would like you also to Google some examples of metaphor. We didn't dive deep into that. And I think it's a very powerful tool to not be using the repetition of like and as in a simile all the time that you learn in year six, but to strengthen your whole piece with this extended metaphor that you might be able to weave in. And lastly, I'd like you to try your independent task, which is this slide here and come up with lots of uh, examples of these techniques using this image to inspire you. Or, and or, after you've done that, why not try and start to bring it together in the form of one descriptive paragraph? So very well done. Um, if I just do this, there we are. It's getting darker here and you're done. So do get in touch do send me an email with the information we are getting your stuff it's starting to come in uh, i hope to see you on your bubble days and we'll be in touch soon bye